Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. In this video, we're going to continue our adventure creation series that we've been going through the from the basic book, the Moldvay basic book. I'll put a link in the description if you are not familiar with what the Moldvay basic book is. We've got 10 scenarios listed here. We've gone through most of them. And I'm kind of leaving some of the kind of the easiest ones in a way, but also the hardest ones till the end. This one I'm going to do fulfilling a quest. So fulfilling a quest is like 90% of the adventures you see out there, right? It's like somebody asked the party to do a thing. This is a scenario in which a king or other NPC provides a reason for adventuring. The variation is from the gods. It's quite often recovering a sacred object. But I was inspired. I was watching YouTube and watching the channel How to d and I'll put a link. Uh, there's a Dungeon Master Roundtable that they were talking about how to make interesting gibbering mouthers. And gibbering mouther is one of my favorite monsters. It's weird and, and yeah, it's just so cool. There are no gibbering mouthers in the BX system, so we're going to have to create one. That's our first problem. But they talked about all kinds of different ideas of them absorbing people, of them having intelligence, of it being a, a, it's created by an accident. Watch the video. It's really interesting. So what I thought was, what if a wizard that was experimenting with things maybe they shouldn't have, uh, was converted into effectively what is a gibbering mouther. They are in their lair, and the local barony or king it has sent for a wizard from another land to help fix this problem because they need their high-level wizard back. However, there are books and things in this lair that are being destroyed by this creature as it's moving around. So while they're waiting for the other wizard to arrive, the party is going to go in there without killing this thing because they want to save it effectively and steal, right, the book. So the quest is to get into this place, this magician's uh, lair, avoiding the magician who is now a terrible monster and get the book and get out. And I thought this could be really fun to do and it will allow me to use something that I really like to use, the hex flower. So I've talked about these a few times, but I don't think I've ever actually shown one. This is from the... Uh, escape and follow or something like that hex flower i'm going to put a link to this is created by a person named goblin's henchman there is a uh, i'll put a link in the description to this actual that what they call the hex flower cookbook i think it's called on drive through rpg if you want to check it out and also to the blog post that i'm going to reference here this particular hex flower so the way these things work is you start on a certain hex and you roll 2d6 based on what you roll you move to the next hex you can see they've got various uh, markings on them what we're going to do is use this. Effectively, the party's going to come in at the bottom. The gibbering mouth is going to start at the top where it says escape. The party's going to move around this hex flower basically randomly, and it's a wizard's home, right? So we're going to have it be mystical and stuff until they get to the special, which is in the center. And once they're in the special, that's the, going to be the room with the object they need to collect. Then they need to get to the escape. And that's pretty much the quest. And they'll bounce around. And what we're going to do is, because it's nonlinear... And again, it's a wizard's lair. It's going to be the situation where you go down hallways and you might end up back in the same room, even though you went a different way. It's kind of maze-like and weird. And what we're going to end up having to create here is a few things. Eight kind of standard rooms. Six special rooms, which are the ones you see here with clue and insight. And I'll talk about those when we get to it. The special room, <laughs> the actual special room. We have a near miss, which is going to be a trap room. We've got two guard rooms, so two fights, basically. And then escape will just be the exit. And we're also going to have to create the gibbering mouther. So this is going to be pretty involved. It's going to be a lot of uh, homebrew pieces stuck together uh, based on some things I've seen here. So we'll break it down into small chunks and we'll go from there. Okay, so here are my notes. We're looking at my iPad. The first part is just what I already described, the kind of the setup. Uh, the hexes, again, the special hex is the objective. The plus and minus hexes, we'll talk about when we get there and how the mechanics of this is going to work as we create the actual hex flower. Uh, but the rooms, we need eight rooms, basically, N1 through eight. We also need a trap room. We need two guards, which are going to be the uh, constructs. I think I'm going to do living statues. I feel like this is a third level adventure, so we're going to look to see which living statues make the most sense. And then we're going to need some of those special rooms. So what I've decided to do here, which is a little bit different, is I'm going to jump into the Dungeon Master's Guide. We're actually going to use a few resources here that are different, not just from the BX world, because... You know, that's what we do, right? There's all kinds of resources available for, to us. So this is the first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide. Okay, this is Appendix I Dungeon Dressing. And if we look down here, we've got all kinds of stuff, containers, etc. But right there, we've got Magic User Furnishings. 
So obviously these are things that would be in a room, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to roll a percentile for each of these, of eight, eight of them, and then we're going to have one item per room, and then we're going to go over here to J, which is chamber room other spaces, and kind of get what kind of rooms they might be, right? We'll look at it and say, what kind of room is this? And then we'll build it from there. Okay, so I have the eight rooms. The first one's got a mortar, mortar and pestle uh, room. So I made a quick note. Maybe the room has spices and herbs and stuff in it. A room with a workbench. A room with the pentagram. That happens to actually be the entrance, which is pretty good. Uh, tongs. That could be interesting. A cage. Possibly a trapped monster. I wrote that. Uh, a beaker, which is probably a laboratory. A candle. I'm thinking that might be like some kind of a library, you know, with the magic candles floating around. Uh, and then a cauldron, which I'm going to probably think of as like vats, right? If you ever read like some of the old fiction where the wizards are creating constructs and vats and stuff. Okay, looking at these rooms, let's see what we could have here. Uh, armory, audience, aviary, ooh, banquet, barracks, bath, bestiary, hmm, pantry, chapel, cistern, huh, conjuring, hmm. Okay, well, clearly this entrance, the pentagon entrance is going, the pentagram entrance rather, is going to be a conjuring area. So we've got a cage that's clearly that could be a bestiary or it could also be a prison. Uh, let's call it a prison. So that's going to be some kind of chaotic monster, right? Uh, we've got beakers. So that's a laboratory. We know that. So really tongs and workbench are the two that are going to be tricky here. I think the first one with the mortar and pestle is going to probably be a storage room. Ah, tongs could be a smithy. This is why this is nice, because what you end up with here is... I wouldn't have thought smithy, right? But, you know, a magic user might be making magic weapons or magic helmets or things they need to melt metal for, especially if they're doing constructs. So let's see, we've got workbench. That could be next nearly anything. Well, they have workshop, workroom. That's pretty uh, torture chamber. I don't know about that. Uh, let's go with work start workshop because the other room's going to be a... So that's going to be a workshop. You know, high-level wizards are creating all kinds of stuff. So that gives us some basic ideas of what we can use. But then, let's not stop there. Let's jump online and use some modern tools. You've seen me use this before. This is Donjon. I'll put a link in the description. If you go to just the random generator at the top, we say it opens you up to uh, quests. But if we go down here, we've got random locations. And we can say uh, in dungeon, let's say. And let's look at this. And let's just roll a d10 and see what we get. And see if we can plug that in as a description somewhere. This may or may not work. We'll try it. Three. A narrow card on the 10th level, a company of Minotaur warriors wandering aimlessly here. Interesting. Okay, so that doesn't really fit anything we have. So let's roll again. Again, I could have just done this instead. A dark chamber, a swarm of shadows. Okay, I like that. So we've got a swarm of shadows. We have a conjuring room. So let's say swarm of shadows. In that room. And let's do, let's say two more, and we'll, then we'll kind of start to mix this together. Five, Horde of Mindless Zombies. That could be good for the, the creation bat. And we're going to go here. Six, this gives us, uh, same thing. Oh, uh, two Mindless Zombies. Let's regenerate. And six is Shadows again. Huh. Oh, interesting. Several alcoves are cut into the walls here. I like that. So I'm actually going to put that in the candle room. Pack of giant rats hunting. That doesn't sound that interesting to me. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put that in the room with the cage. And maybe they're molesting or maybe whatever is in the cage is hunting for them. Maybe a harpy. I like harpies. Several iron blobs are scattered around the room. Oh, that's good for the smithy. Again, part of this is for, you know, the idea that you get a little sensory when you're coming in here. It's not just like, you come into this room and it's some spices. We have some broken boxes. Why? Why are there broken and rotted boxes here? It can add a little bit of mystery. Make it, because remember, d and is about exploration. So this is this is an exploration adventure. They're going to fight things. There'll be some monsters because the, the, there's chaotic stuff going on in here ever since the wizard turned themselves. But at the same time, we want this to feel like... Uh, like this, they're investigating a strange, interesting place. So let's see what I have left. The workshop needs something flavorful, I think. Iron chains hanging from the north side of the... Okay. Okay, so since this, this chains hanging from the room and there's a workbench in here, I'm thinking there's going to be something on the table. Maybe like something dissected or whatever. A chute. 
pack of gargoyles. Ooh. Annihilation. That all sounds too high level for me. Okay, we may have just... Sometimes you reach the end of it, right? So let's cut away from here and let's take a look at what else we might just come up on our own. Okay, so we're going to use something in the Dungeon Master's Guide called Dungeon Dressing. And it's got smells, air currents, strange sounds. But what we're going to do is we're going to roll on this, this table that has a lot of things and create our own mini table so that we can create a lot of variation during play. All right, so we've got, for instance, air currents. So I'm going to roll a few times on this. Okay. 73, still very chill. 63, still. 7, breeze, slight damp. Okay, so I've rolled six things here. I've got still, very chill, still, light breeze and damp, earthy smell, slight breeze, strong downdraft. So that's my first D6. Second D6 that you'll roll, and again, we're going to combine these, and I'll show you how it's done. Second one's going to be odors. Here I've got dank, moldy smell, Chlorine smell, earthy smell, putrid smell, rotting vegetation, and urine. So now if I roll 2d6, I've got a 2 and a 3. That gives me the air is still with an earthy smell. Right? You see how it's going to work? There's a few other ones we're going to throw in here, and then I'll show you the whole chart. Okay, so as I was wrapping this up, I changed it a little bit to make it easier. What I've done is I've made it so that you roll a d4, a d6, a d8, and d10 all at once. And I made... Four charts, one for each die. So we're going to do exactly that, and I will give you an example of a room. In each one of these six spaces, I'm going to create one combo. That'll be the starting thing. Then if they go into the room again, we can roll it on the fly. So let's take the first room. Okay, the D4 is reading a four, which is misted. Okay, so the room is misted. The D6 is reading a two. The air is still. It is, you, this, there's a smell of rotting vegetation. And... A giggling sound okay that's gonna be in our first room let's do the second room we got four four six and one so that gives us misted earthy smell urine ooh, an earthy urine smell and uh, they hear a bang or a slam somewhere interesting okay so we have two more effectively hexes to fill the two guardians and then also the trap and then we're going to go in and just kind of do a quick distribution of monsters and treasure in the space because, of course, characters are going to want to steal treasure as they go. And we'll kind of put this whole thing together in a big, <laughs> with a big bow on it and see how it functions. And I guess the final thing we'll do is make that gibbering mouther. Once again, I'm in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Instead of just using a straight up trap, which I could roll on here, there's a whole, I'll roll one. Uh, 92. Very Vent with acid. Okay, that's cool, you know, if you're just kind of doing a general dungeon crawl, but it, it, just to have a vent with acid doesn't make any sense unless we put it in context with the player characters doing something maybe they shouldn't. And what I normally like to do is risk, reward, slash, good, bad, right? So let's take a look. Let's say we go acid vent and we look up here at the common dungeon features. There's, you know, domes, there's altars, there's statues. Okay, so let's say that there is a statue in this room and we know that we want acid vents as a trap it's going to shoot uh, acid out so let's say we do something and then we can look down here right we have ages animates anti-magic these are tricks basically so let's take a look at this and say if the player characters do something bad to the statue let's say they steal the necklace that's around the statue's neck that has gems and jewelry in it it will shoot acid at them right and hurt them but if they do something positive like put a coin in the statue's hand or something to that effect and of course you're going to have it with the hand out or some kind of thing and then it could do something uh you know as a positive to people right so we can play it up like that i think this makes traps and stuff more interesting plus why would he have this uh <laughs> statue here that just shoots acid out of people randomly right it's in his house so this is what we're going to do. We're going to create this statue. It's going to shoot acid if they try to steal the necklace. But the necklace itself has the ability to grant something. Let's say healing. So if the characters do the right thing, they will be, get healed. If they do the wrong thing and steal the thing, they'll get shot with acid. Although I guess they'll have a magic necklace. So maybe it's worth it. As is usual, once I started typing it, I kind of changed it up a little bit. That's often what happens when we do this. So what I'm going to do instead of having it just be like a healing or something, because I 
I find that not to be that interesting. And again, why would he have that there? Instead, what I'm going to do is this. There's a statue of the magic user in the room. It's got the priceless necklace. If you try to steal the necklace, acid's going to shoot from the ceiling, 4d6. Pretty devastating if you're a thief. But they will notice that the statue's eyes are minor value gems. One of them has fallen out onto the ground. If they place the eye, the gem, back into the eye, as opposed to stealing it, it will open a secret door. This will go to either the special room, if they haven't been there yet, or to the exit, whichever is more needed, basically, by the party. And, of course, if they enter this room again, and they had placed the eye socket in, it will, the gem in the eye socket, I should say, it will be back out again. This is the wizard's way to kind of travel around the space in a very kind of subtle manner that most people wouldn't notice. Okay, let's put this all together, and then we'll wrap up by creating the gibbering mouther. So let's take a look at the map. So the way a hex flower works, briefly, you can again, you can check this out on Goblin's Henchman's uh, blog to get more detail, but effectively you start off on one hex. In this case, we're going to start at N3, that's going to be our entrance, and the enemy is going to start in the escape hex. Okay, you're going to roll 2d6, so I'll do that now, 4 and 2 is 6. When I look at a 6 on, on the chart here, 6 shows me down. Now, in some cases, it, you can't go that direction. So I see down leads me to N6, so I'll go from N3. So I start the thing by talking about the pen, the pentagram on the ground. The It's a conjuring room, and then they travel through a hallway, the only exit out of here. They travel, and what they end up in is a room that's a laboratory. There is a smell of burnt potions. There's broken glass here everywhere because, of course, the wizard hasn't been able to tend to it. So they're in this laboratory with all kinds of broken up stuff, right? So they do whatever they're going to do there. Then they want to leave there. I roll again. I got a 10. That puts me in N7. Again, they travel through winding corridors and they end up in a library. There are candles floating around everywhere. They see lots of books that uh, the, there's nothing written on them at all, but if they look at the books via the light of these magical candles, they can read them. And again, there may or may not be an encounter in this room. Then they travel to the next and they roll. And if I get, so now what's going to be different here, if I get into one of these uh, spaces that are purple on the left, those are positive spaces. So let's say I go into uh, plus C, which is what I'm calling it on my map here. I will describe the room as we figured out, right? So plus C is, it's a mist-filled room with an earthy smell. You can kind of get a scent of urine and you hear a bang in the distance, okay? But because they're in a positive room, the next time they roll, so I roll again, I got an eight, and eight would put me basically in that plus R, but because they're in the positive room, it's gonna move me one, one hex side towards my goal. And let's say I'm looking for the special. What I'm gonna get, and instead of going to, um, instead of, plus R, they're going to end up in N7 again. That way they're not going around in circles, right? This is kind of the, the well, in that case, they kind of are, but it's going to move them closer to their goal. If on the other hand, let's say that they were in minus C over there, the green, and they rolled, let's say, an eight or nine that would have put them in the special space, actually, they will end up in an eight or in near miss because that will always move them one hex space away from their goal. So that way, these are kind of the, the cursed squares versus the good squares. I think that'll work out pretty well. Obviously, if they enter the rooms with the guardians, they're going to be attacked because they're intruders. The Every single time the party moves, like each time you roll on the hex flower, you'll also roll for the gibbering mouth or which will move around. And if they encounter it, they'll have an encounter. And of course, they can flee, which they'll probably need to do or you know, somehow trap it, whatever they're going to do with it. And in each one of these rooms, they can have separate encounters. So let's create the Mouther. I think this part's going to be real fun. So I'm not going to look up a gibbering Mouther. I have a pretty good idea of what it is, right? You've got this blob that's kind of moving around with all these mouths and it's talking in, in different languages and saying different things. And it creates this uh, kind of strange confusion about itself. So that's a confusion spell, right? The other thing a gibbering Mouther does is it creates a, uh, a rounded, it, it kind of makes the ground soft. Well, we have a, again, a high-level wizard, so we've got a stone to mud spell, right? So we can have that being kind of cast out around it. So we're going to use that as our basis. And then in addition to that, it also spits these things at blind people. Instead of doing that, I'm going to have it throw a random spell every round. So there's going to be a lot going on when they encounter this thing. It is going to be, even if they want to kill it, it's probably going to be too powerful for a third-level party. But the idea here is that this thing is going to be to be avoided. And if the, as long as they don't get snuck up on and nobody gets frozen in place with the confusion, 
they should be able to run from it. And that's what they will do. And again, it will move in a random direction. It's not going to make chase. It'll always move randomly. If they can get the, the books that they need to get from the special area and then escape without destroying the gibbering mouther and without dying, they will be rewarded for their quest. So I'm going to write up the stats for this thing, neaten this whole thing up a little bit, and then we'll come back to it. Okay, so we have all our pieces in place. I'm going to walk through it briefly, and then we'll see how it plays out. Based on everything I've added here, I think this is about a fourth level adventure. I put three to five because it depends on your party, of course, and the, how big the group is. Story is pretty simple. Wizard experimentation that's gone bad. He or she has turned themselves into a terrible monster, basically a gibbering mother. They're wandering around their wizard's tower, causing all kinds of havoc. There is another wizard coming to help, but it'll be some time. So they want to send the party in to get as much information as possible. What they want to do is send you in to figure out what the wizard was working on and what turned them into this monster and get that information out, like some kind of spell book. Uh, we could say maybe there was a divination spell, like a cast. So perhaps the party knows that there are these like runes that they have picked up, runes that are etched in stone. You know, you can give them as much information or as little as you want, depending on how long, how you want this to play out. When the party approaches, the tower looks real simple. It's right, it's a hundred foot tower, 30 foot diameter on a nice hillside. Everything seems fine. They open the door, they look in, there's a, a nice entryway, well appointed tapestries, couches, chairs, maybe some trays of food left out. There's a simple wooden door. No sign of the wizard, of course. When they enter into the, the door, they will find that clearly the space is bigger than they think. Classic wizard trope. They follow this corridor down and they'll end up in hex N3. So let me jump over and again show you the, how the hex follower works. So they're going to be here in N3. From this point, anywhere they go is going, there's, there's going to be one to four doors effectively in each one of these spaces. You describe the spaces you want make it seem really atmospheric, have the party play out the scene. When they leave through one of the doors, because they don't know the way, obviously the wizard could navigate through no problem, but because the party doesn't know the way, no matter what door they leave from, you're going to be rolling on the hex flower to move them around. Now, a note here is that if you're starting in N3 and you roll basically to go down, right? Normally on hex flower, you would just pass through it and go to the top again, but obviously the top's the end. So in this case, it has you going to and six, which is in the middle. After they have the item that, they're, that they want, if they can't get out the exit and start to drag, you could have that be a way out. But typically they're gonna to wanna to get to the escape or the exit part. You're gonna start with the party in N3. You're gonna start with the Mouther in the, part, the E space or the escape pace at the top. Every turn, you know, every time they leave a, a space, you're gonna roll for where the party goes and where the Mouther goes. It's not chasing them specifically, but they could encounter it. As they travel through these different rooms, N1 through 8, those are kind of more typical rooms. The uh, the ones that are purple and green are going to be kind of specialty weird rooms. All right, so we're back here looking at the adventure. Again, we've got Wizard's Tower. We've got the objective. We've got the rooms. So now we're looking N N1. I'm just going to go 1 through 8. They are not going to go through it in a linear fashion by any means. Uh, one is got is a storage room with spices. There's a mortar and pestle in here where they've been grinding down some spices. There's also some of the boxes are broken open and some of the wood is rotted and wet. Atmospheric. Maybe the party will get creative and look for certain spices or ideas if they have uh, something to think about. Otherwise, they can move on. And two, they're going to enter into some kind of workshop. There's going to be this table in the center with chains hanging from the ceiling. Uh, there's some kind of creature cut up on the the table. It will be a monster. I just wrote monster because I think it should be something weird, like some something out of the, something that's not in the BX book. It's not going to be an orc, right, or an owl bear. It's going to be something weird and tentacly and bizarre. Probably write something up for that, or you know, use your imagination. Uh, three, which is the room they're starting in, there's a pentagram carved in the ground. Uh, there is a line of salt tracing it. In the center of it is a pile of treasure because I rolled treasure with the shadows and there's a lot of treasure here. If they break, if something human or alive enters into the uh, pentagram, they will release the shadows that are in there or if they break the salt line. If they leave it alone, they're fine. If they figure out a way to get some of the stuff out without, a, without entering in or disturbing the salt line, they can have that treasure that they get. There's some scrolls here. There's some magic. There's a magical helmet of alignment change. So that's not ideal. 
um, and so forth. In room N4, this is a smithy or a workshop. There's these uh, blobs of silver uh, metal gathered around the room is the first thing they see. And then they notice one of the blobs is moving and it's absorbing three dead adventurers, people who came here to loot the, the wizard's place because they thought he was gone. And what they will find if they destroy the ooze and search these bodies is a bunch of treasure. And they can feel okay about taking this treasure for sure because it's from these adventurers, I guess, right? That's going to be a little unclear. Uh, in room five, there is going to be a succubus. It's going to have the same stats as a harpy because there are no succubus in, in uh, BX. And it's going to be basically being, it's going to be in a cage, uh, you know, looking like a, a beautiful woman. And it's going to be uh, being harassed by giant rats. So you can play that up, maybe even have the succubus slash harpy join the party, etc. She could be a cool NPC to use. In uh, room six is a laboratory. It's uh, going to be, it's going to smell terrible. It's going to be broken and burnt beakers because basically you had all these experiments going that he hasn't been checking on, right? So it's basically a mess in here. There's nothing of value. It's just a place where they can mess around. Again, a creative party might be able to be like, can we take some of this spoiled po uh, potion? Maybe it'll be poisonous or something. And you can play around with that if you like. And seven is going to be a library. Uh, I rolled a monster in here, uh, five werewolves. So I'm assuming they'd probably be in human form. They're going to be looking through the library, probably unable to figure it out. This library, you can only see the books by using the magical candles. And the magical candles are only going to operate with somebody who has good intentions, which is not the werewolves. So you're going to see a bunch of people in here, guys and girls, looking at these blank books, trying to figure out what the heck is up. But there's no treasure in here, save that there's a lot of knowledge in these books. Don John, which I showed earlier, and I'll put a link in the description, has a thing for like ancient tomes. So if you want to put some cool books in there, you could obviously add that to it before you start. Just throw some cool books in there. Maybe that's something for the players to discover. Finally, room eight, there is a, I, I rolled cauldron, so I'm going to put vats in the floor that basically zombies are pouring out of. There's also quite a bit of treasure here. I rolled silver and gold. I'm going to say that the, the vats are filled with this like liquid silver and gold, and that's what these zombies are coming out of. So this was an ingredient. If they want to steal the silver and gold, they certainly can. The zombies are going to be an ongoing threat. Once they discover this room, if they kill the zombies, uh, there's going to be 1d4 coming out every turn, so there'll be more zombies. So if they keep coming back to this room, because that can happen, of course, there might be more zombies, depending on how long they were gone. So you'll just need to keep track of that. The way I would probably do it is once they've passed by this room, just keep a marker of every turn that passes. And then if they end up back in the room, you can just roll how many new zombies are there. Easy as that. Okay, now we've got our special rooms. Again, these operate a little bit differently. Let's look at the map again. The way these work is if you're in the purple side and whatever you roll is always going to put you one hex side closer to your goal, whether it be the special or the escape. If you're in the green side, whatever you roll is going to put you one hex side further away from your goal. These are just atmospheric rooms. Uh, we've got misty, still, rotting vegetation, giggling, misty, earthy smell, smells of urine. You hear a bang or a slam. These all have different... Uh, kind of atmospherics, and what I would do for sure in these rooms is every time they enter one of them, you should roll a new set. I'll leave the list at the bottom so that it's easy, right? You just roll one of each of the dice and you can quickly generate new smells and sounds. This way, this section seems bigger and more mysterious. The other rooms, when they re-enter them, they're gonna see they were already there and they're gonna be like, whoa, we went around in circles. It's, it's supposed to create a confusing maze experience, right? Because they're in this bizarre wizard's room. So maybe the party will try to figure out a way to uh, navigate better, like to control where they're going. And if they come up with something clever, obviously I would allow them to do that. You want to make this fun. We have our room marked near miss uh, on the hex map. I'm going to mark it with a T when I draw my own map. This is the trap room. Again, this has the statue in there. If, they, if they're greedy and they try to steal the statue's necklace, they're going to get hit. If they uh, help the statue effect, I guess put the eye back in, then they will get a boon. There's two guard rooms as well. These are straight up guards that are going to attack anything that's not supposed to be there. This is probably a good idea for the party to flee because they are living statues, crystal or iron, and they are tough. Okay, so let's get down to our wizard. He's been turned into my version of the Gibbering Mouther. I'm giving him a hit dice of seven. The reason why I did that is he's a 14th level wizard. Wizards get a d4 for hit die normally. So, you know, a regular hit die for a monster is d8. So I just went half. I gave him AC8, just a little bit better than no armor, because a wizard doesn't typically wear armor. And he's got 1d8 attacks to stick with the typical Gibbering Mouther thing, right? Depending on uh, 1d8 mouths can attack at a time. Um, if you're hit by three or more, you save uh, against turn to stone. That seems to be the best save as far as like freezing. Or you'll be trapped inside. 
And I just wrote creative solutions. I'm not going to have a way to get out certain roles. Let the DM figure that out, or I'll figure it out based on what the party does. I don't like making up a whole bunch of mechanics to cover a situation because almost certainly the party's going to do something different than I wrote here anyways. So, you know, figure it out, adjudicate it. Um, then, uh, if the ground around the Mother is going to be muddy because of the rock to stone, uh, rock to stone, the rock to mud spell, uh, it's going to slow down movement. And each round, a random spell will be cast. So I just, I literally rolled a D6 and a D12 to come up with 12 different spells that could be cast. Some of the times they'll make no difference at all, right? Wizard lock. Okay, there's one D4 doors in each room, right? So if they walk into this room with this gibbering mouther and there's two doors and the, uh, the first round, the gibbering mouther casts wizard lock, only one of those doors is going to be accessible without smashing it down or whatever or a knock spell, right? So this could be bad, especially if there's only one door. Uh, hold person, invisibility, magic missile, contact higher plane, which will probably do effectively nothing. Wizard lock again could be a problem. Read languages, which will do effectively nothing. Knock, which will undo the wizard lock. Um, invisible stalker is going to send an invisible stalker after the party. That is not a good thing. Uh, Anti-magic shell, obviously, protection from normal missiles, and detect invisible. So it's going to keep cranking out these spells. Um, again, this encounter is really meant to be like you see it, you run. But somebody might get held by the... Oh, I forgot to write it in here. There's also going to be a confusion effect for anybody who can hear it. So the first time they get confused, if they can get away from it, they're going to want to like block their ears or, you know, typical stuff. Block their ears so they don't hear it. Um, and that way they can move past the gibbering mouther. Okay, well, there we go. We've created an adventure with a quest. Now, of course, the reason why this one is a quest, because you might be saying, well, this is just an adventure where you're going separate. Because here there's a goal. I think the main thing with the quest adventure is that there's a goal, right? Most of the time when you're running these OSR type games or old school games, because you're getting experience points for treasure, there doesn't always need to be a goal, right? It's like, oh, look, a cavern full of gold. Let's get as much as we can and get out while we survive. But the thing is, if you did that here, you might grab some of the treasure from the first room, then boot. But here, because it's a quest, you've got to try to find that item. So that, that keeps the party kind of in the loop of this type of dungeon. So you can make it a little bit weird because... They got a reason to be there. It's not kind of like, why are we here again? So in any case, I hope you enjoyed this. I am going to love running this for my party. I'm sure they're going to love this. Um, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. Ring the bell for notifications. If you have any questions or comments about the channel in general or this particular adventure, let me know and I'll talk to you soon.